Why did I come to this backwater place? Haley muttered, lowering her head and clenching her teeth to hold back tears. In reality, the view from the cafe terrace was breathtaking. Picturesque cliffs cut through the turquoise expanse of the sea, a clear sky above. A stony beach, wet pebbles glistening in the sunlight. Down below, on pristine white lounges, elderly women lay, occasionally chatting and laughing loudly. Clearly, they were enjoying their vacation. To die, that's all that's left. Haley suddenly felt a growing anger engulfing her. Haley Davis, writing books for over a decade, had achieved considerable success, perhaps not reaching the heights of popular detective masters, but over the years she had built her own audience eagerly awaiting each new novel. Her releases disappeared from shelves within the first days of sales. Haile held literary evenings, met with readers, receiving a tremendous energy boost from them. She had long established a successful partnership with her favorite publishing house, where there were no disagreements about rhythm, text quality, or royalties. Live and rejoice, one might think. However, a few weeks ago, Haley experienced a creative crisis. She had literally squeezed her latest novel out of herself. Formerly loyal readers immediately reacted, posting dozens of negative reviews on literary internet portals. This time, inspiration was nowhere to be found. Haley began to feel the futility of her efforts, as if she had already come up with everything imaginable. She loved observing people, spying on interesting situations, as real life often surpassed any TV series. All that remained was to conclude the sequence of events, add intriguing nuances, and generously infuse them with emotions. The problem was, the work wasn't progressing. As soon as Haley began to invent a new story, she realized she had already done something similar. And if not her, then her colleagues, which was even more frightening, a discerning audience could easily accuse her of plagiarism. For days on end, Haley lay on the couch watching TV series, hoping to find some new ideas there. All she needed was one bright moment to latch onto and create a complete work. But even there, everything seemed dull. From the first minutes of watching, Haley would get annoyed, marveling at the predictability of the plots and the simplicity of the characters. Could this be it? Could her creativity really be at its end? During the weekend, Haley's daughter Vivian came to visit. Vivian didn't miss the exhaustion in her mother's eyes. Mom, you're just tired. Everyone goes through it in life, Vivian said, gently smiling. You can't button up all the buttons. There will always be a wind somewhere. What if, right at this cafe, the man of your dreams walks in? Haley smirked. They settled at a table in a street cafe under the branches of a weeping willow. At my age, can one still meet the man of their dreams, huh? Perfect characters, darling, only exist on the pages of books. In real life, they don't exist. The woman sighed. The moment Haley thought about her age, her mood deteriorated completely. It wasn't just the mood. Everything was deteriorating for her. Um. And now, apparently, there will be no more books, daughter. It's over. Haley Davis, the writer, has gone to print. Oh, here we go, Vivian exclaimed. Mum, you're brilliant and the most talented person I know. You've had creative crises before, remember? The last time you dropped everything and went to Brazil. I remember inspiration visited you there. Sir oh, what's Brazil got to do with it now? I don't want to. Then aren't there interesting places here? Listen to me, I know of a small seaside town really off the beaten path with only private resorts. And recently I completed a project and received a decent bonus. So, Mum, I can afford to send my most beloved person in the world on a vacation. Just like that. In response, Haley waved her hands. And, oh, no, absolutely not on your account. Actually, I can afford it myself. The royalties from my previous novels haven't been spent yet. But will there be new ones? So consider it my personal contribution to literature, Vivian happily said. Mum, please, you can't imagine how much joy it brings me to spend money on you. Haley couldn't argue against that argument. When Vivian was little, money was tight. Just a year after the little girl turned one, her father left them and Haley was left alone, without a job, with a small child in her arms. She then got a job as a journalist for the local newspaper, but the salary barely covered the basics. Haley always had a penchant for storytelling, but in her youth, she considered herself not talented enough. 
That was until the newspaper published her short story, just to fill a vacant space. Immediately after the newspaper came out, the editorial office received letters with enthusiastic feedback. Inspired by the success, Haley started writing more and more. Gradually, she moved on to larger formats. Finally, she dared to send her manuscripts to a publishing house. They started working with her right away, but there was no talk of good royalties because nobody knew anything about the writer Haley Davis. Despite modest income, Haley tried to provide her daughter with the best of everything. She always aimed to ensure that her child never felt deprived. It seemed like the girl took everything for granted. However, in her teenage years, Vivian revealed that she saw how difficult it was for her mom. She dreamed of getting an education and earning enough money so that Haley could finally stop working nights. Many years had passed since then. Haley had long been living comfortably, and Vivian was content with everything, but the daughter's desire to thank her mother for all her efforts hadn't disappeared. And now here was Haley in this seemingly paradise, which was supposed to bring her inspiration. However, she knew that no external aesthetics, no magnificence of nature, could be a source of imagination for her. For Haley's creativity, new non-trivial real stories were needed, not centuries-old pines and the soothing expanse of the sea. Haley had already finished her lukewarm coffee, unaware that today she would take a step into a whirlwind of events that would change her life. The weather was turning sour. Fine rain started to drizzle, and the sky became covered with heavy clouds. Glancing at her watch, Haley was about to head back to the hotel. At that moment, a thin, red-haired woman appeared at the cafe entrance. Upon entering, she carefully took off her bright yellow raincoat, shook her head splashing nearby people, stepped on someone's foot, dropped her purse, and made a ridiculous face. Her braid unraveled, and her coppery hair attracted everyone's attention. The visitor seemed painfully familiar to Haley. Well, of course, it was her university classmate, Alison York. Haley had been friends with her during their time at university, but had stopped communicating for various reasons. Apparently, Alison recognized her too. She froze in the doorway for a few seconds, squinting slightly, and then headed towards Haley's table with a joyful smile. Bynum, is that you? Alison exclaimed loudly. The maiden name made Haley flinch in surprise. Of course it's me, and you haven't changed at all, even looking better. Haley smiled, stood up from her chair, and embraced her friend. Are you about to leave? Alison asked, pointing to her empty cup. Maybe you'll stay and we can catch up. It's been so many years, hasn't it? Alison looked outstanding. At her age, appearance was almost always the result of lifestyle and good genetics. Haley could genuinely say that her former classmate not only preserved her natural beauty, but even improved with age. In contrast to Haley, Alison was always an exemplary student in university. If the night before each exam, Haley feverishly read notes, trying to do the nearly impossible, cramming a semester's worth of material into her head, Alison slept because she had long ago not only memorized, but also reviewed everything several times. Oddly enough, the results were the same. Haley learned through erudition and an excellent memory, while Alison achieved top grades through discipline and diligent study. Alison came to study from the North, enrolling in the philology department independently, without assistance or money. There was no money in their family. The girl understood well that she didn't possess any extraordinary talents, so she paved her own way with persistence, diligence, and colossal industriousness. Teachers loved such students because they didn't cause problems, listened attentively, and never missed lectures, and their results could confidently be added to the treasury of their own pedagogical achievements. However, boys overlooked Alison. She seemed too dull, provincial, and overly serious to them, although what could one expect from them at such an age? They might be legally adults, but essentially still boys. Alison, on the other hand, wanted to find a serious guy, focused on studies and eventually on building a family. That's why it was more than strange that in her third year, she fell madly in love with the carefree Zach Davis from the history department. Zach attended university for anything but a degree. He skillfully played the guitar, sang beautifully, actively participated in all creative events and turned the heads of freshmen. He was the star of the faculty and even the dean paid no attention to his studies. 
Alison was in love with him for over a year until she found out that he was dating Haley. Zack and Haley got married right after university, and a year later, Vivian was born. Zack's delicate artistic nature couldn't withstand the challenges of diapers and the nighttime cries of the baby, so the new father soon set off on a solo journey, abandoning his family. Alison didn't miss the opportunity to gloat about it, and Haley expressed feigned sympathy. They hadn't seen each other since. And now, after so many years, Alison York, striking and radiant, sat in front of Haley Davis, as if nothing had happened. Despite not keeping in touch, I've heard about your professional career, Alison mysteriously smiled. Read a couple of your books. You write amazingly. Well done. Well, I've read various articles about you on the internet. I really appreciate hearing that. Thank you, Haley said. And Zack never showed up, did he? Alison asked with fake sympathy, as if she had been waiting all these years to ask this question. I heard he's somewhere in Argentina or Brazil. Yes, I've heard that too, Haley calmly replied, but I stopped caring about him a long time ago, you know. Were you alone all these years? Alison raised an eyebrow skeptically. Well, not exactly, Haley shrugged. There were relationships, but nothing serious. And how did things turn out for you? Alison suddenly came to life. Oh, I was married. At first everything was wonderful, planning to have a child. But then he started drinking. It went on for about ten years. He eventually drank himself to death. And no children happened, Alison said. Transforming into a sorrowful and weak woman, Haley instantly felt a surge of sympathy and empathy toward her former classmate Alison. Alison clearly didn't deserve such a fate. Somewhere deep down in Haley's soul, there was still a lingering sense of guilt for Zack, choosing her over Alison. Alison's heart had been broken because of her, because of Haley. Although delving into the past, summoning people from there, was a futile endeavor. The past had to remain in the past forever. One must learn to turn the page at the right time. Alison, your personal life will improve, and you can get married at our age, believe me, Haley said, sighing as she took her friend's hand. Oh, I'm not losing hope. Alison nodded. I have admirers, and as you can see, I take care of myself. But unlike you, I don't have a daughter, and it's too late for me to have one. And you... tell me, what do you do? What brings you to this town? Haley quickly changed the subject. For many years, I worked as an assistant manager at a concrete plant, Alison began. The director was wonderful. Everything was so well organized. The place was good, with bonuses and benefits. But then the boss retired and they brought in a new young guy. He decided that a 40-year-old secretary wasn't suitable for him. He needed a tall, blonde girl to smile and serve coffee. Yeah, a typical story, Haley nodded. With your experience, it should be easy to find a new job, right? Well, actually, yes, especially since I got good recommendations from my former boss. Alison leaned back in her chair thoughtfully. But there are not many large enterprises around here. And then I found an interesting job in this town. I'm a companion to an elderly lady. What do you mean by companion? Sorry, like a caregiver? Haley asked. No, of course not, Alison grimaced. It's a wealthy, respectable family. The husband is a businessman, a patron of the arts, and the wife is an artist, very sophisticated. They are both 60. Eleanor Williams is her name. She started getting sick. She almost stopped walking. Spends whole days in her studio, painting. They have a housekeeper who does all the household chores. They recently hired a male nurse to help her with medical matters, and I, let's say, am essential for her soul. They needed someone with a humanities education, well-versed in literature and art. Oh, you're perfect for that role, Haley said sincerely. Well, what can I say? Alison blushed slightly. In short, I come every day, take her for a walk. Sometimes we walk here, along the coast. I read to her aloud, not just for the sake of it, but with subsequent discussions of the work, Alison smiled. It reminded me of Professor Gregoryson's lectures. Finally, all those space-time continuums came in handy. Oh, that's right, Haley laughed. So, is the job interesting for you? Actually, yes, Alison nodded, lowering her voice as if someone might overhear. But this lady is very strange. You know, they have her paintings hanging all over the house, Seemingly ordinary landscapes, various seas, nature scenes. But there's something off about them, Haley. And now she's painting a series of pictures that are terrifying to look at. 
Oh, come on. Haley became intrigued, sensing that she was about to hear something very important. Alison leaned in, switching to a whisper. She says these paintings are mystical. They influence reality and predict the future. Can you imagine? Alison shuddered. I just can't look at them for more than a couple of seconds. It's weird. They somehow affect me, like casting a spell. All right, what's depicted on them? asked Haley. In different ways, replied Alison. I try not to look at them. But a couple of months ago, she was painting our cliff, some mysterious stains in the sea below, and a floating girl in a wedding dress in the air. And what do you think? Just recently, Haley, they reported in the news that a local high school girl, due to unrequited love, wore a white dress, a veil, and jumped off the cliff exactly from there. Fishermen saved her. But the fact, how could the old lady know about it? And in such detail. Haley felt a slight tremor in her body, as if a cool sea breeze touched her heated skin. This was what she always felt when she sensed a new plot. Sometimes just a superficial thought was enough, from which a complete story subsequently emerged. Listen, Alison, can I see these paintings? Haley cautiously asked, trying not to reveal her excitement. Well, yes, you can, Alison was surprised. I guess Our Lady will be happy to chat with a real writer. Let me talk to her, and if she's okay with it, I'll let you know, and you can come over. Back in the hotel, Haley opened her laptop and searched for the name Eleanor Williams. Nothing. Almost every site displayed information about famous actresses. Only after scrolling through many pages did Haley find a few terse lines about this mysterious woman. On the Artists' Union website, where she had been a member for many years, it mentioned her participation in some cultural event seven years ago. And that was it. Nevertheless, in Haley's mind, various new plot options were born. Mysterious paintings that anticipated future events. It was a fantastic premise, a foundation on which she could spin both a mystical plot and romantic twists. Haley was practically rubbing her hands in anticipation. Finally, she felt the solid ground beneath her feet and began to climb out of the stagnant swamp that was pulling her deeper every day. Haley envisioned the Williams house just like that. Similar interiors were often described as lavish and wealthy. The deliberate luxury of the house could rival a grand throne room in a palace. However, everything seemed a bit artificial. These walls were about 20 years old, so the mouldings and balustrades looked somewhat out of place. It was as if a modern actress had donned theatrical costumes from the Baroque era over trendy ripped jeans. But it wasn't Haley's place to judge the homeowner's tastes. She was a guest here and therefore had to treat this place with due respect. Dozens of paintings adorned the walls, hung too close to each other without any apparent logic, in ornate frames. Haley wasn't well versed in art, so she couldn't immediately identify their genre, but she noted the uniqueness of the paintings, even a certain peculiarity. This seemed to be the effect Alison was talking about the day before. These paintings were something you wanted to gaze at for a long time without interruption. Don't even ask me about these paintings, Alison warned her. Eleanor told me something about them, but I didn't remember anything. Are those mystical paintings among these? Haley whispered. No, Alison shook her head. She keeps them in her studio upstairs. She says you shouldn't look at those paintings for too long, especially random people, or else the plots will drain the viewer's life energy and immediately manifest in reality. Honestly, I'm glad she hides them. The paintings are eerie, and thank goodness we don't have to look at them in the living room. Listen, Alison, you're intriguing me more and more. Haley smiled. Yeah, there are plenty of mysteries in the Williams house, Alison winked. I bet Our Lady will impress you. That's what she knows how to do. Nah! Well, I'm looking forward to it, replied Haley. But where is she? Wait a minute. The nurse will bring her down. There's a whole setup between the floors, Alison answered, and called somewhere inside the house. Rory, bring Eleanor down, please. We have a guest. Haley sat on the edge of the sofa in the living room and carefully placed the brought cake on the table, adjusting the pristine white tablecloth beneath it. The feeling that she was in a museum didn't leave Haley. Rory wheeled an armchair into the living room, on which sat the very Eleanor as if on a throne. Her gathered silver hair, massive rings on delicate aristocratic fingers, an exquisite necklace around her neck, and a bright satin dress. All of these adorned her. 
Not even her excessive thinness and grey circles under her eyes spoiled the woman. Haley stared at the homeowner as if enchanted. It was evident that in her youth Eleanor had been a true beauty. What a lovely guest our dear Alison brought to us, Eleanor beamed, flashing her pearly white's teeth. And such a magnificent name you have, Haley. Haley was slightly taken aback. She rose and extended her hand to Eleanor with a smile. Eleanor gave her fingers a gentle squeeze and gestured for her to sit again. You have a stunning house, Haley exclaimed. Oh, thank you, dear, Eleanor nodded. But I believe you're fibbing a bit. Your poses and gestures give you away. You're not comfortable here. In yes, I won't hide it. I'm not accustomed to such interiors, Haley admitted, blushing. Well, I appreciate your honesty, dear, Eleanor smiled broadly. Shall we have some tea, then? No. In an instant, a helper in a white apron entered the living room and placed a porcelain teapot and three tea sets on the table. Thank you, Kristen. I'll take it from here, Eleanor said, and started pouring tea into the cups, delicately lifting her pinky finger, adorned with a massive ring featuring a large ruby. Actually, having staff in our house is not a luxury but a necessity. I hardly move around and may take care of myself, but the house requires constant attention, as I'm sure you understand. Once upon a time, I used to manage it all by myself. I remember, just as you finished cleaning in one corner, new dust settled in the other. Haley felt like the hostess was somehow justifying her luxurious lifestyle. It was entirely evident that this elderly lady was not a mere socialite living off her husband's wealth. There was depth and internal strength in her, which she might intentionally conceal. While Eleanor poured tea, Alison sliced the cake. Mmm, the homeowner exclaimed with pleasure after tasting the cake. Absolutely exquisite choice. I love it when it's not overly sweet and has a subtle tang. Oh, I'm glad I guessed your taste, Haley rejoiced. Well, Haley, it's a great honor for me to have you in my home, Eleanor said. As soon as Alison told me that her writer friend wanted to talk to me about my artwork, I promptly sent Rory to the bookstore to get your work. Quite impressive, I must say. Honestly, I'm not a big fan of modern fiction, but I read your detective novel in one evening. Haley often received compliments on her work, but now she felt a slow blush creeping onto her cheeks. Thank you, your feedback means a lot to me, Haley responded. I don't know if Alison told you, but I was going through a prolonged creative crisis. However, the moment she mentioned your mysterious painting's inspiration, you see, instantly awakened in me. So I'm already grateful to you for that. So you got inspired without even seeing my works? Eleanor marveled. Yes, precisely, nodded Haley. I find an intriguing message or idea, and my creativity is ready to materialize it immediately. But I look forward to the moment when I see your wonderful works. Well, as I understand, Alison has already prepared you, shared her impressions of my work, didn't she? The artist asked. Well, you see, not so much about her impressions, but more about the evident mystical meaning they carry, clarified Haley, and their ability to predict future events, for instance. It's quite unusual for me. I won't believe for a moment that Alison didn't share her emotions about my art. Eleanor squinted her eyes. When I showed her some of my paintings, it was noticeable that some of them even scared her. Well, I wouldn't say scared, Alison interjected, clearly not pleased that they were discussing her in the third person in her presence. You see, Eleanor, it's just that some plots in those paintings evoke ambiguous emotions in me. For example, the one where Cupid is buried in the ground and shoots his arrows from there. Eleanor's expression instantly changed, and she glared at Alison with a malevolent frown. What did you say? she hissed. Evoke disgusting emotions. No, no, not at all. Alison quickly began to defend herself. I didn't say disgusting. I said ambiguous. And do you think I'm deaf? Eleanor unexpectedly shouted. Are you implying I have hearing problems? I distinctly heard you say disgusting. Haley, confirm it. Alison pleaded, turning to her friend for support with a beseeching look. I couldn't have said such a thing. Could I? Yeah, yeah, Eleanor, I didn't hear the word disgusting either, Haley confirmed, looking at both women with fear. In response, Eleanor deliberately placed her teacup on the table slowly and looked scornfully at her companion and the writer. Then, just as deliberately, she reached for the cake, plunging her dry, slender fingers into the moist sponge up to her wrist, 
Gripping the treat with cream in her fist, she swiftly turned to Alison, throwing cake crumbs right into her face. Get out, both of you, wretches! Eleanor hysterically screamed. You! You conspired to ruin my mood. You're a stupid disgrace, and your little friend is a flatterer. For a few seconds, Haley, wide-eyed with horror and surprise, watched as Alison tried to wipe the sticky cake pieces off her face. Before she could recover, the hostess grabbed another portion of cake and, with a squeal, hurled it at Alison again, this time hitting her in the hair. Haley jumped up and reached out to the furious woman across the table. Eleanor, please calm down, she muttered, trying to reach Eleanor through the table. The elderly woman swiftly swiped her cream-covered fingers across her wheelchair's wheels and rolled back half a meter, tilting her head back and laughing loudly. Kristen appeared in the doorway, observing this horrifying scene with astonishment, but clearly afraid to approach. Eleanor laughed even louder, her laughter resembling the whistling groan of someone mentally distressed. After a minute, Rory briskly entered the room without uttering a word, spun the wheelchair around and quickly rolled her out of the room. Kristen immediately rushed to Alison with a towel in hand, helping her clean the cake remnants from her hair and clothes. Alison, what was that? Haley whispered. This is not the first time she's done that, Alison dryly replied, pursing her lips. She just explodes out of nowhere. Then she calms down and acts like nothing happened. Can you believe it? So you mean to tell me that after something like that you'll continue working with this woman? Haley couldn't believe her ears, thinking that such humiliation wasn't worth any amount of money. Haley, Eleanor is an old sick woman, Alison countered. Alison, but you're not a doctor. You're doing this job voluntarily, and nothing is stopping you from leaving. Your health is more valuable, Haley insisted. Listen, let me handle it myself whether to leave or keep working, Alison said. I get paid more here in a month than I earned in three months at my previous job, and the work isn't complicated. Besides, incidents like this are very rare, believe me. Haley bid farewell politely and hurried to the exit. The events of the day still didn't make sense to her. Eleanor wasn't that old, just about 15 years older than Alison and her. It was too early for dementia, so it was undoubtedly some kind of mental illness. Boarding the bus, Haley took a seat by the window at the back of the cabin. Throughout the journey, she contemplated how terrifying it must be to lose one's mind at an age when life could still be rich and full of joy. At least in her early fifties, Haley sincerely hoped to remain healthy and happy. Once in her room, she immediately went to the shower. Standing under the hot water, Haley tried to wash away all the negative emotions of the day. Eleanor's tantrum marked the end of their further communication, and now it was unlikely that she would discover the secret of those mysterious paintings. That was very disappointing. Yes, she now had a crucial plot point and could come up with something. But she still wanted to see those paintings to get more ideas and inspiration. Haley stepped out of the shower, put on a soft terry cloth robe and applied a fragrant lotion to her hands. Brewing herself some tea, she settled into a cozy chair on the balcony to enjoy the sunset. Finally, her stay in this place became a pleasure for her, despite today's incident. It was as if she had rediscovered all the incredible beauty of this world. The golden sunset, the salty sea air, and the distant cries of seagulls hovering above the water. The idyll was interrupted by a phone call. Haley jumped in surprise, quickly picking up the receiver. Her surprise deepened when she heard the calm and confident voice of Eleanor Williams on the other end of the line. Haley, dear, I didn't have your mobile number, but I called your guest house and found out your room number. I'm calling to apologize for my appalling behavior, the artist spoke. I occasionally have such outbursts and I lose control over myself. I hope I didn't frighten you too much. Oh, it was, well, quite unexpected, Haley replied with relief. But I assure you, both Alison and I handled the situation with understanding, so everything is fine. Thank you, dear, Eleanor sighed. I feel so embarrassed that people around me have to endure my seizures. But illnesses don't choose, alas. No big deal, everything is fine, said Haley. I enjoyed our conversation today, and I was sorry that our meeting had to be interrupted almost at the most interesting part. Are you really interested in my paintings? Eleanor became enthusiastic. Usually no one cares about my modest creations. Well, you see, Eleanor, I'm not an art expert, 
but I immediately liked your works, the ones I saw in the living room. They have uniqueness, mood, and atmosphere, Haley replied. Oh, that's nice, Eleanor clearly smiled. It could be heard in her voice. I hope to see your other work someday, Haley said, hopefully. <laughs> well, if you really want that, I see no reason to delay, Eleanor said. You can come to me any time. If you want, we can hire you as my companion. You can alternate with Alison, who has already grown tired of my company. Oh no, Haley blushed. Communicating with you is definitely not considered work for me. Besides, I'm still on vacation for a few more weeks and languishing in idleness. And that Well then come tomorrow after lunch, I'll gladly continue our conversation. As for Alison Haley, she took the day off. I think she needs time to restore her mental state and fix her hair, Eleanor said with a touch of sarcasm. Haley immediately understood that this lady's eccentric behavior was not caused by illness at all. She probably had a fiery temperament before, and now she was simply bored in her golden cage, unable to venture beyond her own garden. The next day, before her visit to Eleanor's house, Haley visited the pastry shop again. This time, she decided to choose a safer dessert in terms of its impact. Although Alison mentioned that such outbursts were rare for the artist, giving her something heavy like a chocolate bar was unsafe. A marshmallow, on the other hand, seemed like a better choice, light, airy, not getting stuck in the hair and leaving no traces on clothing. As Haley approached the entrance of Eleanor's house, the door swung open abruptly, and Eleanor rolled towards her in her wheelchair, cheerfully spinning the wheels. Rory followed the elderly woman and grabbed the wheelchair from behind. Eleanor, be careful, please. You'll burn out the clutch, he joked. No need to catch up with me. I'm not disabled, she grumbled. I can drive straight myself. Let's hurry with the car instead. She caught up with Haley and smiled. Hello, Haley. I see a subtle irony in your choice of dessert, Eleanor remarked, nodding towards the marshmallow. Oh, no, I just picked it randomly. It's just very delicious in this pastry shop, Haley winked. Are you going somewhere? Yes, dear, an emergency came up, Eleanor replied seriously. I need to visit the clinic urgently. They admitted my friend. She's not feeling well. Oh, I'm sorry then. I'll come by next time, Haley replied with concern. No, no, don't be. If you're not in a hurry, you can go there with me. Then we'll come back here together. It's really close, I assure you. Haley agreed. Rory pulled the car up to the gates, helped Eleanor into the seat, and quickly folded and stowed the wheelchair in the trunk. Haley sat next to Eleanor. She would have loved to start a conversation about the paintings now, but she could see that the artist's face was troubled. Eleanor was peering out the rear window, clearly eager to see the hospital gates as soon as possible. My Marta has cancer, Eleanor explained her anxious state. We met at the cafe in that hospital a few months ago and we became friends. I go there for my treatment and she has cancer. Today she got worse. Oh, that's terrible, Haley sympathetically replied. Cancer is unpredictable, alas. I wish your friend a speedy recovery. Yes, yes, I believe everything will be fine, Eleanor replied. Marta is a simple and very good person. By the way, she loves marshmallows. Would you mind if we treat her? If, of course, the doctors allow. Of course, let her enjoy it if it's allowed. Haley nodded and handed the box to Eleanor. They reached the destination in ten minutes. Rory swiftly unfolded the wheelchair, helped his owner onto it, and she continued on her own. There were convenient ramps everywhere on the hospital grounds. Stay here on the bench for a while, get some fresh air, Eleanor shouted to Haley and Rory as she swiftly moved toward the entrance of the ward. They got out of the car and sat on the nearest bench. What to talk about with a male nurse? Haley had no idea, but Rory initiated the conversation. Quite a character, Eleanor, don't you think? He asked with a slight smirk. Oh, more than that, Haley replied, laughing. Yesterday's incident impressed me, of course, but Alison said it happens rarely. Rarely. Unfortunately, it's becoming more and more frequent lately. The guy shook his head. That's why they hired me. Her illness started progressing. I can't disclose the diagnosis, but you see it for yourself. She's not entirely okay. Listen, Rory, how did it happen that you, at such a young age, work as a caregiver? Haley didn't want to discuss Eleanor behind her back, so she preferred to change the subject. Well, what's wrong with that? Rory shrugged. I completed the nurse course, but I didn't make it to university this year. I'll try again next year. You have to earn money, and they pay here quite well, very well, actually. And in general... Eleanor and I get along. 
I noticed that yesterday, Haley nodded. She even looks at you, Rory, with warmth. Hey. Well, you know, she has a daughter, Grace. She lives abroad, and Grace's son is a little younger than me. In other words, Eleanor's grandson. So she drew parallels and says that her grandson and I are very alike, Rory explained. Oh, I see. Well, that makes sense, Haley replied. She just clearly lacks social interaction. She lacks exactly equal companionship, Haley. You know, friends on the same level in terms of intelligence and culture, Rory said. Eleanor is intelligent, well-read. I've seen her friends. One is like an old lady talking about seedlings, manure, and the garden. Another one keeps getting endless plastic surgeries, but I can see she still looks like an old lady even after the surgery, just all tightened up. So, is one of them in the hospital now? Haley asked. No, the guy shook his head. Those two have been around for a long time, but this one, she's also strange. They became friends during treatment. Now they communicate. And you, even though you're much younger than her, you fit her. I realized that yesterday. But to be honest, I'm genuinely interested in her personality, Haley sincerely replied. You don't become friends in one day, but I would enjoy talking to her further. In 20 minutes, Eleanor appeared on the hospital porch, still skillfully maneuvering her wheelchair, swiftly navigating the ramps. A tall, dark-haired man of about 45 accompanied her, holding a tiny grey kitten in his arms. Oh, that's her attending physician, Taylor Frey, Rory explained, leaning towards Haley. What kind of creature is he bringing us now? Eleanor approached Haley and introduced her companion. It looked somewhat cinematic. Where else does a doctor accompany a patient, introducing her to relatives? They are usually busy with work, but apparently Eleanor knew how to win over even the busiest person. However, the situation clarified in the next moment. Hello, Dr. Frey shook hands with Rory and nodded at Haley, looking intently at her had to step out with Eleanor to pass her new pet to you. With these words, Dr. Frey handed the kitten to Haley. Take it, Haley. Hold on to it until we get home, Eleanor said. I can't simultaneously steer the wheelchair and hold on to this cute, fluffy creature. I'm glad to hand over this miracle into reliable hands. Dr. Frey spoke seriously, but his eyes were smiling. A handsome, tall man in a white coat with an adorable kitten in his arms. An impeccable combination to captivate any woman in a matter of seconds. That's how Haley would describe this character in her novel. She cradled the trembling, fluffy bundle in her hands. Where did you get him? She asked Eleanor in surprise. That's none of your business, Eleanor unexpectedly sharply replied. Just take him and let's go. Haley was afraid that yesterday's story might repeat itself, so she decided not to ask Eleanor any more questions and not to pay attention to her rude tone. Rory nodded approvingly, catching her gaze as if he could read the woman's thoughts. The doctor walked with them to the car, and while the male nurse settled Eleanor into her seat, he opened the car door for Haley and even offered her a hand to make it easier for her to sit. Haley wasn't used to such gallantry, so she blushed slightly. Nice to meet you. Have a safe journey and a good day. Dr. Frey flashed a dazzling smile at Haley and gently closed the car door. Oh, Taylor Frey, Eleanor chuckled as they drove away. I knew right away it wasn't just ordinary politeness on his part. And you, dear Haley, take a closer look. Smart, handsome, single. This doctor can resuscitate you from a heart attack if needed. Rarely do you come across such a specimen. Haley found it delightful to think that the doctor had actually noticed her. Even if it was just one piercing glance, Eleanor noticed it too. What did Haley's daughter, Vivian, say about the man of dreams? It turns out they exist in real life, not just on the pages of Haley Davis's novels. As they approached the house, a grey Mercedes, belonging to the homeowner, Julian Williams, was already parked by the gate. Oh, my husband doesn't want to work at all, Eleanor sarcastically remarked. It's only 3 p.m. and he's already home. Julian apparently noticed his wife's approaching car, came out of the house and personally opened the gate. Eleanor Rory, where have you been? Not answering calls, I was getting worried. I was at the hospital visiting a friend, Eleanor irritably replied. Julian, meet Haley. She's a writer and my new interesting conversationalist. Well, very pleased, welcome. He nodded to the guest and pointed towards the house. Are you coming with the cat? Hello, no, I'm afraid it's your new pet, 
Haley smiled in response. Eleanor, what's going on? Julian exclaimed. You know I can't stand all these animals. Tell me you're joking. Yes, Haley made a joke, Eleanor replied. It's not our pet. It's mine, personally. He will live in my room and warm me in moments of melancholy. And Julian, those moments are becoming more frequent. Even from this short dialogue, it was clear that the spouse's relationship had once included love and understanding, but now things weren't so smooth. Apparently, Julian bore the brunt of his wife's illness since she spent most of her time with him in the same house. No one knew what she might have thrown at him during an episode, a piece of cake or a brass candlestick. When they entered the house, Eleanor immediately ordered to give the kitten to Kristen and arranged to buy everything necessary for him. Make sure this cute creature is in my room only when I want it, she said. I was hasty about him living with me. He'll make a mess there. It all looked strange for someone who had just brought a kitten home. But Haley was no longer surprised, understanding that mood swings and sudden changes of opinion were a common occurrence for Eleanor. Well, Haley, let's ask Kristen to make coffee and head to the workshop, Eleanor kindly suggested. This second visit of yours is dedicated to completely different matters. Oh, gladly, Haley smiled, although even without that you have quite a lot of interesting things. I'd say fateful, the woman winked at her. Remember my words. Meeting with Taylor won't be your last, Haley. Given Alison's stories about Eleanor's paintings predicting the future, Haley had no doubt that it was worth listening to Eleanor's words. After sorting out the new pet, Eleanor finally invited Haley into her inner sanctum, the workshop. The only way to enter it was through the hostess's bedroom. Inside, a real creative mess prevailed. Eleanor tried not to touch anything, believing that despite the visual chaos, each item had its designated place. Well, my dear, I won't keep you waiting. I'll show you three canvases that scared our Alison, but I'm sure you'll have a different reaction, Eleanor said. She rolling up to a large cabinet, effortlessly sliding it aside and pressing a small recess behind it. The door moved, revealing a hidden niche where several rolled-up canvases lay. Perhaps I can help, Haley offered, surprised by the hostess's strange manipulations. No, no, I can manage myself here, Eleanor replied. Nobody knows about this place. If something happens to me, you'll know where my paintings are stored. Haley was surprised by such a statement. She didn't understand where Eleanor's trust in her came from and why she had uttered such a peculiar phrase. Eleanor unfolded the canvases and handed them to her guest. Interlocked hands with blurred faces wriggling in the ground and above them a huge eye on one canvas. On another, a delicate female hand holding a massive apple one side of which was rotten and covered with white mold. And yet another painting, depicting a girl riding a two-wheeled bicycle in a crowd of people. Once again, clear silhouettes and absent faces. What did I expect? Vases with flowers, perhaps, Haley thought to herself, examining the paintings of the homeowner. It was impossible to look away from them. There was no eerie feeling Alison complained about. These canvases instantly immersed her in their own world, enveloping her in inexplicable magic. Haley examined each of Eleanor's paintings one by one, noticing new details that didn't immediately catch the eye during a cursory glance. She felt a similar sensation during her visit to the Salvador Dali Museum in Paris. Haley couldn't leave until late in the evening, captivated by the intricate symbolism. Oh, I see you liked them, Eleanor said with satisfaction, never taking her eyes off the guest. But I, I, I can't even describe my feelings, Haley replied quietly. It's as if you plunged me into a parallel layer of reality. Honestly, I don't fully understand the meaning of these scenes yet, but I want to get to the bottom of it. Well then, dear, you should understand that I'm unlikely to decipher for you the meanings I embedded in the paintings, Eleanor replied with a sly smile. Everyone sees their own. And what about the idea that your paintings predict the future? Haley asked cautiously. Take the first work, for example. People are clearly doing something terrible, but who is watching them, huh? You answered your own question, Eleanor smiled at her. Isn't life full of stories with a similar meaning? Some commit while others observe. Haley sensed that something was definitely off here. More precisely, everything was not as straightforward as it seemed. Eleanor wanted her guest to contemplate on her own 
or simply wanted to confuse Haley to divert her attention from something genuinely important. It was at this moment that the writer caught herself thinking that not only the paintings, but everything happening at the moment had a hidden layer, another level concealed from those around, holding answers to many questions. She needed to distract herself to later return to contemplating the meaning of these paintings. In her heart, Haley expected to see more mundane everyday scenes, like the one where the girl jumped off the cliff. And now she had to decipher these symbolic puzzles. Kristin brought them coffee with fresh pastries. The women sat at a small table right in the middle of the workshop, and Haley began to ask questions on unrelated topics. Eleanor happily shared stories about her life. Her first husband, a scientist, whom she divorced after several years of marriage, he went to Asia and achieved success in science there. You see, Haley, Ralph and I were like two flames that couldn't coexist in the same space, Eleanor said. He was immersed in his medical research, writing his dissertation, teaching. He had no time for me or the family at all, and I, I was involved in creativity. I had no interest in domestic life. Separately, we loved each other very much, but being together was, unfortunately, impossible. That's why we parted ways, but we maintained warm relations. Grace grew up and went to study with him. Ralph funded her expensive education at the local university, and our daughter became a respected lawyer. And with Julian, everything is easy and calm for you, right? Is that the secret to your long marriage? Haley inquired. But not that it was easy, but he always cooled me down, grounded me, sighed Eleanor. He accepted that I would never become a housewife. He is a very rational, practical person, and I always brought chaos and flight into his life. Perhaps that's why he loved me. Why are you speaking in the past tense, loved, Haley wondered. Yes, because we're talking about the past. The apple is already poisoned and rotting, cryptically replied Eleanor. But that's a separate story. Now, I am different, and it's not about age, Haley. I increasingly crave solitude so there aren't many people in my inner circle. We have a house in the wilderness, in the woods, simple, made of wood. I love being there, in nature, and maybe someday I'll move there permanently. Oh, Eleanor, you know I'm the same, Haley agreed. Perhaps my profession leaves a certain imprint, but for me, I feel very good alone with my books. I rarely see my friends. I have wonderful relations with my daughter, but she works in another city and she has had her own life for a long time. And you know, my life is very harmonious. <laughs> That's because you and I are on the same wavelength, dear, Eleanor smiled. But you're still very young, just a little older than my grace. Isn't it too early for you, Haley, to immerse yourself in this wonderful solitude, especially since my dear Dr. Taylor Frey has some plans for you? Haley blushed. Why does just a mention of Dr. Frey make her behave like in her school years? Nervous? and embarrassed. Sorry, Eleanor, what do you mean? Haley asked. Yep. You can scold me now, but I gave him your phone number. I visited him today, he asked about you, started mumbling something, making up a reason why he supposedly should contact you. Hmm, like a child. Taylor Frey called that same evening. Apparently, he couldn't come up with a reason for the meeting, stating that he read one of Haley's books and wanted to get her autograph. They met the next day at a cafe, in Dr. Frey's hands was indeed a well-worn book by Haley. She remembered that other men had used a similar approach for a closer acquaintance, but had never actually read her novel. Imagine her surprise when he opened the book, and she revealing underlined passages and notes in the margins. Are you saying you actually read this detective? She asked in amazement. What's surprising you? Taylor asked. If it's about the notes, I always read like this with a pencil. If the work is worthy, of course. Just understand, my literature is more geared towards a female audience, Haley replied. Well, perhaps. But you know, I liked you from the start. And through your books, you undoubtedly transmit what's inside you, Taylor said. Now I know a bit more about you, Haley. That same evening, they walked for a long time, leisurely talking about everything under the sun. Taylor shared a bit about his life, but Haley felt that the man was reluctant to reveal personal details. Long divorced, he had an adult son working in another city, and that was about it. However, Haley had no desire to bombard him with questions or dig into anything. She savoured the moment and was sure they would meet again. As a parting gesture, 
Taylor gallantly kissed Haley's hand and asked if he could count on another meeting. Haley came home late. Entering her room without undressing, she approached the mirror. She looked tired and slightly insane. Her face reflected hopes, plans, fears, and joy. All of this turned her soul into a boiling cauldron. Even if this doesn't last very long, there's nothing to be afraid of. After all, I never even dreamed of such, Haley thought, already half asleep. In the morning, she arrived at the Williams house and found Eleanor sitting at a table with papers and a calculator in hand. Haley wanted to ask what the homeowner was calculating, but her husband entered the living room and he asked her the same question. Well, you're here, Julian, she said, not looking up from the papers, and I'm opening a cat shelter. Here, the estimate, take a look. I need this money today. Deduct it from our account, please. Confidently, she handed her husband a sheet of paper. Julian adjusted his glasses and began reviewing the columns of numbers, furrowing his brows. So, Eleanor, are you out of your mind, he muttered. And why the hell a shelter? Why should I allocate money from our family budget for this nonsense? Well, because it's our shared money, have you forgotten? Eleanor raised her voice. I'm opening a shelter, and that's final. I'm getting help from student volunteers. They've rented a space outside the city. They plan to buy cages, beds, food. I won't be paying for this nonsense, he irritably threw the papers on the table. Where did these cats come from, anyway? These are Marta's cats, Eleanor replied. Right now, she's taking care of them in her home, and it's very tough for her. <coughs> well, put them to sleep, then, if it's hard for her, he suggested, then immediately stopped when he met his wife's stern gaze. This is your Marta. She's crazy. You used to have normal friends, but no, you found some crazy cat lady. Better put your cruelty to sleep, Julian, and we'll take care of the cats. That's my decision, Eleanor insisted. And by the way, think about it. You have elections coming up. Tell your voters that you've opened a cat shelter and now take care of the furry ones. Just imagine how many sentimental women will admire you. You are fool. Julian's expression instantly changed. He took the estimate in his hands again, saying thoughtfully as he rubbed his chin, well, it's not such a large sum for a good cause. Where should it be transferred to? You don't need to transfer anything. Bring it in cash to Marta. I'll write you the address, Eleanor replied, smiling cunningly. When Julian left, Haley applauded. Wow, you pulled off a maneuver, pure aerobatics. You could confidently go sell cosmetics through catalogues. You'd become rich instantly. I'm already very rich, dear, Eleanor softly replied, and it's not about the money at all. The next day, Eleanor suggested to Haley to take a walk along the promenade. Rory dropped her off saying he would be back for her in a couple of hours. This time, Eleanor was wearing a sundress, and Haley noticed a vibrant colored tattoo on her forearm. Judging by the design and the freshness of the ink, it seemed fairly recent. Looks great, doesn't it? Eleanor asked, catching Haley's gaze. I decided to get it a few months ago, almost right after the surgery. It's a symbol of a new life. Yes, very beautiful, but unexpected, Haley replied, feeling a bit embarrassed. Worst thing, Haley, is to only do what others expect of you in this life, Eleanor said. Initially, they went to a cafe, ordered lemonade and berry pastries, and simply talked. If, in the first few days of their interaction, Haley felt a bit awkward in Eleanor's presence, now she sensed an invisible connection with her. Eleanor was incredibly interesting. She knew how to listen, asking the right questions, and she could tell stories in a way that made it impossible to look away. The age difference between them was hardly noticeable. Despite her physical weakness, Eleanor was strong in spirit and brimming with energy and humor. She had the ability to uplift and inspire. It was strange that there were so few people around her, and her husband never seemed eager to spend much time with her. Perhaps it was because of her illness, which made communication challenging. After the cafe, the women decided to take a stroll. The daytime heat subsided, and the sky seemed to have lowered, touching the clouds on the proud mountain peaks. Haley pushed Eleanor's wheelchair along the coastline. Both of them remained silent, as if their thoughts were synchronized. They had walked quite far from the town when it became evident that a downpour was imminent. Shelters were visible in the distance, offering a place to take cover, and Haley quickened her pace, pushing the wheelchair ahead with effort. Initially, sporadic large raindrops touched their skin, as if giving a final warning of the impending storm. And then, 
Within a few seconds, a true deluge began. Haley would have run, but the wheelchair's wheels kept getting stuck in the sand. Stop, Haley, stop, Eleanor suddenly shouted. Where are you rushing to? To that shelter over there, Haley replied, catching her breath. We're about to get soaked. And why do you think we should run from it, huh? Eleanor asked with a smile. Just relax and do this. With these words, she spread her arms wide and tilted her head back, exposing her face to the cool raindrops. The key is to relax and enjoy, please, the artist added, smiling broadly. Haley let go of the wheelchair handles and extended her arms as well. After the midday heat, the rain felt refreshing and invigorating. Haley could feel her mascara running, water seeping under her dress and into her shoes, but she felt incredibly good. Eleanor began spinning the wheelchair wheels, turning around on her axis and laughing. Several passers-by, running past with umbrellas, looked at the two crazy ladies with a mix of caution and amusement, but Haley and Eleanor didn't care at all about what others might think. When Rory finally reached Eleanor on the phone and found them at the shore, both women were thoroughly soaked. Leaving you for a couple of hours and, well, he gently scolded them, I thought at least you, Haley, had some trace of common sense, but apparently you've fallen under Eleanor's charm and lost your mind altogether. Rory, please don't scold, Eleanor said. We're living our best lives. Call Kristin, have her brew some hot tea for our return, and prepare dry clothes. Days flew by unnoticed. Haley visited Eleanor every other day, and it felt like she had known this woman her entire life. They talked about everything, art, literature, music, and each conversation invariably shifted to simple, everyday matters that were so valuable and thought-provoking. Haley began to regret alternating her visits with Alison. Alison clearly didn't derive the same pleasure from communicating with Eleanor and continued to emphasize that she was doing it solely for the money. At every convenient opportunity, Alison expressed her bewilderment at Haley's sudden friendship with Eleanor. She questioned what common ground Haley could have with this crazy old lady. Additionally, Alison repeatedly mentioned that Eleanor's condition was worsening. Outbursts of aggression were becoming more frequent. Although Haley had never witnessed these moments, she even began to think that the very first episode with the cake might not have happened at all. For several days, Haley didn't visit Eleanor. During the day, she worked on her book, mapping out the main plot lines on a large sheet of paper, connecting character names with arrows, and hanging the scheme on the wall to keep the narrative canvas in sight. Haley would wake up early, eagerly and inspiringly start writing after breakfast, with one idea giving birth to another. She became so absorbed in her work that she didn't want to see or talk to anyone. However, one evening she finally accepted Taylor's invitation to go to the movies. This time, their meeting resembled a real date. Dr. Frey arrived with flowers. During the movie, he accidentally touched her hand. After the screening, they went to a coffee shop and chatted for a long time, sitting on a cozy terrace under blankets. Haley felt like she had turned into one of the romantic heroines of her books. In her real life, such light, extraordinary encounters filled with excitement and shyness hadn't happened in years. Once again, she found herself thinking that Taylor was special. Things were going so well with him that Haley started wondering if there was a catch. She dismissed these thoughts as her professional distortion, attributing everything to her tendency to suspect a hidden menace behind the seemingly perfect character. Over the years, Haley had not only grown accustomed to solitude, but had genuinely enjoyed it. However, her distrust of men had only intensified. Nevertheless, if Taylor had something to hide, it would be challenging to uncover it now. So... Haley decided to relax and savor the moment. The idyll of their evening was disrupted by a call from Allison. Upon hearing that Haley was spending the evening with Taylor, Allison reacted unexpectedly harshly. Ha, you figured it out quickly. What the new friend is not interesting anymore, huh? By the way, she has seizures several times a day now. We're all barely holding on here. Haley had heard a similar tone many years ago when Allison found out about her romance with Zack. Maybe her friend was upset for no reason. Surely Allison must have been acquainted with Taylor, and it wasn't out of the question that he caught her interest too. If the script from the past was repeating itself, Allison's negative reaction would be quite understandable. However, regarding Eleanor, Allison was right. Haley felt a slight pang of conscience. So she promised to visit the artist the next day. 
Eleanor's condition had indeed worsened. She sat in her wheelchair by the window in the living room, motionless, gazing into the distance. Haley called out to her several times, and only after the third attempt did the woman slowly turn her head toward her and offer a faint smile. How's your health, Eleanor? Haley asked gently. My health unchanged won't get any better, she replied. Tonight I painted the picture, the one that concludes my cycle of new works. I named this cycle Omen. Eleanor looked dejected, lost in her thoughts. Two weeks ago, Haley would have felt awkward and left, but now she realized that she could engage in a conversation with this woman without uttering a word. Perhaps we'll listen to some music, Eleanor, Haley suggested. Seeing Eleanor nod in approval, she walked over to the record player. Haley loved flipping through those vinyl records, feeling their familiar childhood scent, brushing off the dust from the glossy surface and unleashing real magic. When Haley was little, her inquisitive child's mind desperately wanted to comprehend how such voluminous enveloping sounds were extracted using a tiny needle. Haley smiled at her memories. Long ago, Zack had explained to her how the record player worked. With a serious face, he talked about analog signals, sound waves. For her, the warmth of the sound and the unique mood created by the notes mattered much more. Now in a foreign house that unexpectedly became familiar to Haley, she placed music for this extraordinary woman with special reverence. It was Schumann's Adagio. Upon hearing the first soothing chords, Eleanor closed her eyes and gently leaned back in her chair. Haley watched her. The play of shadows strangely transformed the woman's face, making it unrecognizable and distant. Julian cautiously entered the living room and tiptoed towards the exit, trying not to disturb his wife. Darling, let's go to the forest cabin today, Eleanor suddenly said, and these words were more of an order than a request. I crave complete silence. To sit by the lake, we can go right now. Well, why not? Julian obediently replied. Let Rory take you. I'll join later. Everything as usual, Julian, she exclaimed irritably. And what time will you be free? Well, not before five in the evening, but as soon as I'm free, I'll come straight there. He hurried to reassure her, kissing the top of her head. And then he headed towards the exit. Haley understood that a long conversation was not possible today. Eleanor clearly wanted to be alone. She kept glancing at her phone, scrolling through something on the screen, frowned, typed, and almost didn't pay attention to her guest. Haley, forgive me, said Eleanor when the music subsided. I'm not feeling well today. I want to lie down and rest. Let's reschedule showing my painting for another day. This moment will be special for me, and believe me, the painting will definitely surprise you. Yes, of course, Eleanor. Health comes first, rest and don't worry, please. I'll call you tomorrow and we'll arrange another meeting. Haley hugged Eleanor goodbye. Eleanor hesitated, as if reluctant to let her guest go. Finally, Haley stepped outside. An oppressive feeling overwhelmed her, something inevitable. For some reason, today she didn't feel like calling Taylor. After all, she had already spent a lot of time with him in recent days, and he was probably working now. To chase away the gloomy thoughts, Haley decided to take a walk along the coast, buy a vanilla ice cream cone, and contemplate the new chapter of her book. This method always worked for Haley. At home, thoughts seemed to get stuck in a confined space. Today's stroll was undeniably successful. There was no trace of oppressive thoughts. The weather delighted with its coolness, and the waves playfully rushed to the shore. Initially, Haley bought ice cream, and a couple of hours later, a hot cocoa. She didn't even think about Eleanor and her paintings, completely immersed in the plot of her new novel. Eh? Haley returned to the boarding house as the evening descended. Filled with inspiration, she quickly entered her room, turned on the kettle, and immediately opened her laptop to start putting down everything that had formed in her mind during the walk. Haley managed to jot down a few lines when the silence of the room was suddenly interrupted by a phone call. It was Allison. Exhaling in frustration, Haley answered. Allison's voice was somber and heavy. It took Haley a moment to grasp the meaning of her words. Haley, Haley, hello, Eleanor is gone. Thunder rumbled outside. Large raindrops slid down the window, merging into each other, resembling abundant tears. How could this happen? Haley's voice became like that of an injured bird. Haley, there was a fire in the forest cabin. I don't know the details. 
Julian just informed me, and he is not himself. He can't speak. Alison provided more details the next morning. The day before, Eleanor went with Rory to the forest cabin, where the nurse lit the fireplace and promptly returned to the city. That evening, he was invited to his sister's birthday party. According to him, Eleanor lay down in her room, citing fatigue. She said she would wait for her husband, who was supposed to arrive in an hour. However, Julian was delayed and reached the forest cabin only by evening. On site, he found ruins. Several local residents with buckets stood around, helpless. Even to call the fire service, one had to go through the woods towards the road, where there was signal reception. The firefighters, ambulance and police arrived only an hour later. There's nothing left of Eleanor, Haley. Julian saw it himself when they carried her out. I can't believe it, Alison whispered. Only one ring on her finger survived. The one with the ruby. As Haley listened to all this in her mind, dozens of alternative scenarios unfolded. Haley often crafted such stories, so she simply couldn't believe in the single version presented. There were indeed many questions, and Haley immediately began to ask them of Alison, her sole source of information. Alison, are you sure it happened exactly like that? Haley asked, trying to gather her thoughts. Look for yourself. So many absurd coincidences. Rory left early. Julian, on the contrary, was delayed. Haley, you're used to making everyone a suspect in your detective stories, Alison replied. Rory left around 2 p.m., and he headed straight to the children's party. There are plenty of witnesses, you understand. And Julian's car has a dash cam. He was actually busy with errands all day. The fire started around 4 p.m. Julian arrived at the forest cabin closer to 6 p.m. The police investigated everything overnight. It's just a tragic accident. Could Eleanor have taken her own life? Haley pondered but didn't voice this version allude. Haley didn't want to think about it. Of course, work was out of the question. She called Julian to express her condolences. He thanked her almost inaudibly and hung up immediately. Later, Haley contacted Alison again, offering her assistance. However, she found out that a funeral agency had taken care of the arrangements and Julian was just notifying close ones. The date of the mourning ceremony was not yet determined and depended on the arrival of Grace, Eleanor's daughter, who was supposed to fly in with her father, Eleanor's first husband. Haley went to the local church she often passed by. She bought a wax candle, lit it, and held it in her hands for a long time. Haley didn't want to put the candle. Her consciousness refused to believe that Eleanor was no more. At night, Haley couldn't sleep. She didn't cry, there were no tears. There was just a piercing pain in her chest, as if a hole had formed and a cold wind blew through it. Haley's condition was much heavier and more agonizing. How had she become so attached to Eleanor in such a short time? Perhaps in her, she saw a part of herself, free-spirited, independent, the version of herself that Haley had always wanted to be, but was a little afraid to become. Ignoring stereotypes and limitations, not caring about what strangers would say if you got a tattoo at 60 or danced in the rain on the waterfront. Haley replayed their last meeting in her mind and realized that Eleanor knew in advance that they wouldn't see each other again. That's why she was so detached, why she hugged Haley so tightly in farewell and called her painting the last one. The thought of the painting made Haley jump on the bed. She paced around the room, trying to remember exactly what Eleanor had said about her final canvas. Haley found it particularly crucial to clarify this moment. She could hardly wait for morning to call Alison. Oh God, Haley, what can't you let people sleep so early? Alison grumbled dissatisfiedly. Alison, tell me, have you been to the Williams's house? Haley asked. After the tragedy, were you there? Well, suppose... Alison hesitated. What's the matter? Alison, have you seen her last painting? Haley inquired, trying not to arouse suspicion. There was no painting, Alison dryly replied. Together with Julian, we went up to her studio. It's a mess there. Oil tubes open, everything in paint, canvases piled on top of each other. I only saw some sketches on paper of a few old works we've already seen. Alison, tell me, can I get into that studio? Eleanor told me that she made some sketches for me for my book. Haley lied, fearing that her persistence might seem suspicious. Well, how would I know? Alison muttered. Ask Julian. 
Well, I guess you can go in. In any case, give him a call. Haley decided not to call him. She opened the messenger and sent a message. A short response from him arrived a few minutes later. Yes, you can. Something troubled Haley. Perhaps her own writer's imagination influenced her because she was used to spinning any, even the most ordinary event, into cosmic proportions. Take, for example, the story with the painting. Eleanor said she had finished her canvas. Why then did Alison and Julian not find it? It's possible that the artist didn't go to the forest house right away that day, and during that time could have taken the painting somewhere. But why? There was no logic in this since she wanted to show her work to Haley. However, logic was not traceable in many events of the past two days. Calculating the time difference, Haley decided to call Vivian. Her daughter might not be able to solve such mysteries, but at least Haley could talk about it. Mom, what a movie you've got there, Vivian exclaimed after listening to her mother. Sent you for inspiration, and a detective story unfolds in real life, is that so? Oh yes, my dear daughter, agreed Haley. But clearly something is not right here. I don't understand where her painting could disappear. Who needs it? Eleanor painted for herself. It was never exhibited anywhere. And by the way, Vivian, this is not the first painting that disappears like this. Listen, Mum, Vivian said thoughtfully. You mentioned that the nurse Rory was constantly there. Do you know his last name? Date of birth or something? I have nothing to do right now. I'll look for him on social media. Why, wondered Haley. He's not suspicious. At the time of the tragedy, Rory was far from home. Oh no, that's not what I meant, Mum, Vivian clarified. What if he was involved in the disappearance of the paintings? After all, he's a new person in the house, not wealthy. Maybe he sold them for a couple of grand each, and there's your extra income and your artist didn't notice. Oh well, that's unlikely, Haley frowned. Rory makes a good impression, but if you really have nothing else to do, then look for it. Vivian called back after ten minutes and shouted loudly into the receiver, Mum, you'll be surprised now. Sending you a photo from your Rory's page, examine it carefully. The phone immediately beeped with a new message, and Haley, impatiently tapping on the screen, opened the photo. It was some family celebration, a table with about ten people sitting around it. Haley recognized Rory right away, although he looked much younger in the photo. He held a juice glass in one hand and embraced a man with the other. As Haley scrutinized his face, she was shocked. It was Taylor Frey. At the bottom, there was a caption, Dad's Anniversary. Haley immediately dialed her daughter's number. Well, Mom, impressed, Vivian asked. It's a good thing you told me so much about this doctor. I've looked at his photos from all sources, and this Rory guy has no photos on any of his social media pages. I found only one, but he hasn't logged in there for a very long time. Wait a minute. Something doesn't add up in my head, muttered Haley. So, Rory is Taylor's son, and both of them intentionally hid it for some reason. Taylor mentioned he had a son, but it sounded as if it was someone else. And Rory seemed to mention that his parents work at the factory, the family has no money, he didn't get into medical school, and he completed nursing courses. That's what he told me. Listen, something's not right. Exactly, Mum. Now think about what a mess you've gotten yourself into, Vivian said. You may be an adult, but you really don't understand people at all. Didn't this tailor raise any suspicions with you? Vivian, what was there to be suspicious about? Haley was upset because suspicions did exist, and it turns out her intuition didn't deceive her. Listen, my daughter, I didn't meet him in the middle of nowhere. We met at the hospital. He was Eleanor's attending physician. Can you imagine a safer option? Yeah, a wolf in sheep's clothing, replied Vivian, and it's unclear what they were doing with their son. This information needed careful consideration. Haley always considered herself insightful, good at understanding people. Over the years of writing, she got used to observing and analyzing, so her intuition rarely failed her. But how could she have a glitch precisely with Taylor? Was she so enchanted by him that she completely lost vigilance? Thoughts swirled in Haley's head, drowning out the voice of reason. She wanted to call Taylor immediately, find out everything and tell him that she had seen his photo with his son, with Rory. She almost dialed his number, but changed her mind at the last moment. There might be a more serious story behind all this than just the sale of paintings, which, in general, didn't interest anyone much except Haley. The woman gathered her courage and decided to call Rory. 
inventing a trivial pretext on the go. However, she never got to voice it. The subscriber was out of network coverage. <laughs> well, there's the evidence. The guy disappeared, probably involved in this strange incident that Haley wanted to unravel. If it were only about Eleanor, maybe Haley wouldn't have bothered with all this. But the mysterious story directly intersected with the events of her personal life. She felt deceived because, for the first time in many years, Haley had warm feelings for a man. It was already fully daylight outside when Haley decided to go to the Williams house since Julian allowed her to enter his wife's studio. Haley approached the house and rang the bell. Kristen opened the door, looking at the guest strangely with a hint of guilt. Is everything okay? Haley asked. You're looking at me as if you want to say something. No, no, said Kristen, lowering her eyes. I don't know anything. Why is everyone so suspicious? Clearly she wanted to share something, Haley thought. Or maybe I'm just imagining this conspiracy. Is Julian at home? Haley asked, sitting down on the couch. Yes, he's at home, and Alison too, the housekeeper quickly replied, and left, leaving Haley alone. This is madness, Haley thought again. Everyone is here, but nobody is here. Although I was allowed to go to the studio, then they opened the door. There's no point in sitting here and waiting. Nodding to her own thoughts, Haley went upstairs. On the second floor, she encountered Alison in the corridor, coming out of Julian's room. Alison was wearing a long silk robe, holding a tray with empty coffee cups. It all looked strange and quite inappropriate. Haley had never seen her friend walking around the house in casual clothes. Oh, I was bringing coffee to Julian. He had two cups, Alison tried to justify herself, but new suspicions were already creeping into Haley's mind. How is he? Haley asked sympathetically. He's going through a lot, Alison lowered her eyes. The hardest part is yet to come, Haley. Grace is flying in today, so they decided to schedule the funeral for tomorrow. Tears glistened in Alison's eyes, so Haley didn't ask any more unnecessary questions. Moreover, there were more important tasks at the moment. Listen, can I go to the studio? The guest asked, although the question sounded more like a statement. Alison nodded and headed downstairs. Haley entered Eleanor's studio, a place she always loved to be, although it didn't happen so often. The scent of oil paints and wood instantly created a feeling of coziness. In this small room with a panoramic view of the sea, one not only wanted to create but also to absorb creative energy. Despite the familiar mess, Haley knew where the real treasures were kept. She pushed aside the shelf pressed on the recess in the wall and opened the coveted niche, expecting, as usual, to see numerous canvases. On her way here, the writer suspected that the storage might be empty, so she wasn't even surprised. There was nothing in the niche except for a single painting. Haley unfolded it with trembling hands and felt shivers running down her spine. This was it, the last work of Eleanor Williams. Bright crimson flames with dark, cold shadows from which two figures stretched toward the sky. If her previous paintings had clear figures with blurry shadows, here everything was the opposite. They were unmistakable, Alison and Julian. And above them, in the azure sky, floated Eleanor herself. She looked down at her husband and companion, a smile playing on her face. The allegory was so obvious that there was nothing left to guess. Apparently, the artist planned to get revenge on these two for something. Haley had invented many stories in her life, so it was entirely clear to her why Alison would come out of Julian's bedroom in a bathrobe in the morning. They were lovers, and Eleanor knew it perfectly well. Now the only thing left was to understand what punishment she had prepared for these two. Haley had no doubt that Eleanor didn't necessarily have to be alive to seek revenge. With her inventiveness and eccentricity, she could come up with something that would make enemies flinch at the mere mention of Eleanor's name. Hearing footsteps in the corridor, Haley quickly put away the canvas and closed the niche. The time would come, and she would return for it. It was disappointing that the other paintings had disappeared. Haley grabbed a few unfinished sketches from the table and pretended to scrutinize them intensely when Alison entered the studio. So what's here? Alison asked indifferently. Future lots for the auction? Or junk that will be stored in the attic, huh? I never... Haley looked reproachfully at her friend and remained silent. How quickly her former classmate transformed when she could take off the mask of a loyal companion. A victim of a hysterical old lady with a supposed illness. Enduring her antics just to avoid being left without money. 
Haley, you can take anything from here, Allison allowed. I see you've grown fond of our old lady. You stand here, dejected. Allison, it's strange that you're so easily disposing of Eleanor's property, who, by the way, hasn't become an old lady yet. I thought such matters should be decided by her husband, not the companion, Haley couldn't help but say. Well, property, possibly, Allison said, and these paintings are of no value to worry about, unless Grace wants to take something as a memento, but I seriously doubt that. Anyway, just so you know, Julian listens to my opinion and trusts me. So if I allowed you to take the drawings, it means you can take them, Haley. Smirking, Allison left the studio and closed the door behind her. Haley had long understood that there were no limits to human malice, but how painful it was when even the closest people betrayed you at times. Eleanor, come on, don't let us down there, Haley whispered, pressing the sketches to her chest and raising tear-filled eyes to the sky. After Allison and Julian's connection stopped being a secret, many things became clear to Haley. That's why her former classmate clung so tightly to this place, enduring all the hardships of Eleanor's nasty character just to secure her financial future. For money, but not for her salary, for completely different money, and for the place in the sun that became available after the artist's death. Judging by the plot of the painting, Eleanor knew about it. That's why she treated her companion this way. Only Alison always suffered from Eleanor. Neither Julian, nor Rory, nor even Kristin ever fell under her wrath. Alison wasted no time. The funeral had not yet taken place, and she behaved as a rightful mistress in this house. Would there be real retribution? After all, it was not excluded that Eleanor encrypted metaphorical meanings in her last painting. Alison and Julian would burn in hell, and she would watch them from heaven. Well, this version cooled Haley's indignation. Before tomorrow's funeral ceremony, she needed to take a break. The day promised to be tough. In the evening, Taylor unexpectedly called Haley. She felt her heart betray her, again pounding despite the changing dynamics of their relationship in recent days. Hello, he said casually. I'm sorry I didn't call. Had a few consecutive shifts. My colleague is on vacation. I understand. Besides, I didn't feel like talking to anyone, Haley dryly replied. These events just threw me off balance. Haley, I can hear in your voice that you're upset with me, Dr. Frey said. I won't try to justify myself now. We'll see each other soon, talk, and everything will be as before. Let's talk after the funeral, okay? Despite the overwhelming fatigue and emptiness, Haley felt a warm glow inside, easing the pain in her soul a little. The atmosphere in the funeral hall was unmistakable. Heavy music, barely audible whispers of those present, footsteps echoing through the room. Haley wanted to plug her ears and hear nothing. <laughs> I should go to the administration and ask them to put carpets on the floor, she thought, trying to distract herself somehow. Seated on a bench right by the coffin was a slender woman in a black scarf and dark glasses. Haley recognized her as Grace. She had seen her in photos at Eleanor's house. Next to her sat a tall, grey-haired man, holding her hand and gently stroking her wrist. Apparently he was Eleanor's first husband and Grace's father. Two elderly women were on a bench with their backs to Haley. Judging by their loud sobbing, they were the friends of Eleanor she had heard about. Julian sat a bit apart. Alison walked nearby, feigning grief on her face, closely examining everyone who approached Julian. It seemed like nobody knew her here. She really wanted to be in the spotlight. However, Haley didn't know anyone else who came to bid farewell to Eleanor. Their friendship had been too short. Haley glanced occasionally toward the entrance. Taylor still hadn't arrived, although he had hinted that he would come today. There was still about half an hour until the end of the farewell ceremony, so he had a little time left to come. Suddenly the music stopped, and a second later the walls of the memorial hall trembled from a piercing scream. It was so unexpected that people jumped from their seats, looking around in horror to find the source of the sound. "'What on earth is wrong with you?' Julian exclaimed, but his voice was barely audible. Only Haley remained in place, taking no action, sensing that all this was not just a coincidence. At some point, the heavy, lacquered wooden door swung open abruptly, and confidently walking into the hall was Eleanor Williams. She wore a closed white dress that beautifully complemented her slender figure, along with shoes of the same shade with high heels. Screams were heard. 
One of the friends, turning pale, slid off the bench. Julian, helpless, gasped for air, clutching his chest. Haley also felt a slight dizziness and weakness in her legs, so she hurried to lean against the wall. Even she did not expect such a turn of events. Only the brilliant Eleanor could make such a spectacular entrance at her own funeral. I welcome you, my friends, she loudly proclaimed, spreading her arms wide. I hope I managed to turn your sincere grief over my demise into no less sincere joy over my resurrection. Haley saw Grace subtly smiling, while her father covered his face with his hands, barely restraining laughter. Following Eleanor into the hall were Taylor and Rory, along with several police officers. They confidently headed towards Julian and Allison. Julian Williams, one of them said, you are being detained on suspicion of the murder of Marta Brooke. What? the man shouted, jumping up from his chair. I don't know any Marta. Let's go with us to the station, refresh your memory, the police officer calmly replied. And you, Alison York, are detained on suspicion of attempting to murder Eleanor Williams. What on earth have you gone mad? Julian persisted. What the hell is going on? I repeat, we will sort everything out, the officer calmly responded. The police officer persistently ushered him and Alison toward the exit. Onlookers observed this scene with interest. Grace, removing her glasses and scarf, approached her mother and embraced her. Haley couldn't comprehend anything. All she could do was watch the events unfold. Friends, a monstrous misunderstanding has occurred, Eleanor spoke again. In this coffin lies my friend Marta Brooke. You might say such coincidences only happen in books, right? At this moment, the artist caught Haley's gaze and winked at her. I assure you life throws much more interesting plots at us, the woman continued. A tragedy occurred. Marta came to our forest house where a fire broke out. Without even conducting an examination, they decided it was me. I don't understand anything, dear, one of the friends said. This is nonsense. Julian told us that you left for that house yourself in the morning. That's true, Eleanor nodded. Well, you know, my friend, I am a woman with quirks. Finding out that my husband was cheating on me with his companion, I left for the neighboring town. I thought everyone would be looking for me, but there was silence. I return after three days and they're burying me. Quite a turn of events, dear guests. But how did you leave? You didn't even walk, did you? The second friend suspiciously asked. Oh, why do you think I didn't walk? Eleanor replied. Yes, my joints ached. It was hard to move. So I got lazy. It's much easier to get around in a wheelchair, isn't it? But as you can see, I recovered. It's all thanks to the healing sea air. And how did this woman, Marta, end up in your forest house? Someone else from the relatives asked. And why was she wearing your ring? That's why they thought it was you. I don't know about that, Eleanor shrugged. So much is unclear that even I don't understand. And the ring? Well, I gave it to her the day before. Haley understood that not everyone believed this story, although all the facts seemed to align. Haley herself couldn't fully grasp everything at the moment, as she knew slightly more than the others. Friends, Eleanor addressed those present again. I am very glad that you came. It means I was not indifferent to you. I understand that accepting this fact is not easy yet, but agree. This is the best outcome one could imagine, isn't it? I invite all of you to the restaurant where a memorial lunch has been arranged. Let's celebrate my second birth. The cars have already arrived. People seemed to exhale simultaneously, still not believing what was happening. Some kind of absurd theatre, there's a coffin, but the deceased is alive and instead of a memorial there's a celebration. The woman standing next to Haley muttered, lifting the black lace veil from her face. Gradually, everyone left the hall. Haley finally managed to approach Eleanor. With a subtle motion, Eleanor put a finger to her lips, signaling Haley to stay silent, and hugged her tightly. Forgive me, Haley. I had no other choice and I couldn't tell you everything, Eleanor whispered in her ear. I made you grieve, I know. I had no right to say anything either, Taylor added quietly, unexpectedly standing nearby. What an adventure in my life. Haley exhaled. The adventures are just beginning, Eleanor winked playfully. And your latest painting? It's simply amazing, Haley replied with a smile. Too bad I couldn't decipher the meaning embedded in it. Sna Let's go to our house and you'll find out everything. I think the guests at the restaurant can manage without me for now. Haley still couldn't believe that she was sitting in the living room again, facing Eleanor. They had arrived at the house with Grace and her father. 
Taylor and Rory had also come. The housekeeper, Kristin, had been warned in advance about the magical resurrection of the homeowner, but she was still so shocked that Taylor had to give her a sedative. Eleanor turned out to be not only a talented artist, but also a brilliant actress. Yes, she exuded energy and a zest for life, but the lady skillfully mimicked a frailty and a touch of madness. Haley saw her walking for the first time, and it was a very unusual sensation. Eleanor turned out to be slightly taller than her, graceful like a ballerina. She walked effortlessly around the room in elegant shoes with high heels. Now you could easily think she was about fifty, no more. Haley noticed how Eleanor's ex-husband, Ralph, looked at her admiringly. As it turned out, everyone gathered in the house was not only aware of the situation, but also had certain roles in the realization of such a grand, unthinkable spectacle. Haley calmed down and eagerly waited for everyone to settle into their seats so she could finally learn the truth. The housekeeper, Kristin, brought tea and pastries, still looking at Eleanor warily and distrustfully. Well, Haley, I want to apologize once again. You became an involuntary participant in our scheme, but at the same time, you were the only one who knew nothing, Eleanor said in her usual voice, sipping aromatic tea. Tell me, Haley, did you suspect anything at all? Well, I did find out some facts, Haley nodded, but it was such insignificant information. For example, my daughter, Vivian, looked at Rory's social media and found out that he's Taylor's son. Upon hearing this, Taylor smiled. N ah, now it makes sense why you were so curt yesterday. Probably made up a whole detective story, huh? Dad, I told you, you can't delete everything from the internet, Rory said. And I didn't have access to that old profile. No. Well, did we think that someone else would come along and be interested in all this, Dr. Frey said. And about Alison's connection with your husband, Eleanor, Haley lowered her eyes. I only found out about that yesterday. Dear, this fact will seem the least shocking to you when you hear everything from start to finish, Eleanor replied. Well, don't keep us waiting, Haley crossed her arms over her chest. My brain is just exploding with assumptions. So, before we get to the main events, I'll reveal some important points, Eleanor began her story. If our marriage with Julian seemed perfect to you, it was not at all like that. It's hard to imagine now, but in my youth I was terribly insecure. I graduated from the Academy of Arts, but I always felt unworthy of being a real artist. I loved painting very much, but I thought no one would pay for my painting, so I did everything else. I gave lessons, worked in the theatre, and even belonged to a political party. But painting was always with me. And I always told you that you were very talented, Eleanor's ex-husband Ralph said cautiously. Even in your youth, you painted very uniquely and rebelled against rules and teachers. A true rebel. Dad, wait, Grace said to him. You'll have more time to praise Mom. Now my art has received high praise, not only from my close ones, but about that a bit later, Eleanor smiled. So, after a crazy and passionate marriage with Ralph, from which we got this wonderful, talented creation named Grace, I met Julian, calm, reliable, and circumspect. He never considered me talented. At best, he called my works mere strokes, but he provided for me. At that time, men like him were highly valued. He was noble, helped raise Grace, sparing no expense on her education. And I was useful to him for status. He was making strides in business, and it was important for him to present not just any photo model to company partners, but me, an intelligent girl passionate about painting. For him, appearance was always more important than what was inside. Alas, just look around. It's all gilded these marble-coated coats of arms. It's all fake. To be, not to seem, Taylor said. Yes, you're right, my dear, Eleanor said. To seem. That's what mattered to my husband. To my second husband. But I was into art. I was taking care of our daughter, not thinking about such things. I didn't notice how Julian and I became almost strangers, living on inertia. But outwardly, he maintained the appearance of a good marriage. This year, he nominated himself for deputy, and a divorce would greatly damage his reputation. And here, here's where the most interesting part begins. Mom, can I tell it? Unexpectedly joined the conversation, Grace. A few years ago, I opened a new office and asked my mom to paint canvases for me in a specific style. She did, and sent me the paintings. They fit perfectly into the interior. 
One day a client, a collector, and the owner of a large gallery came to us. He saw these paintings, was delighted, and wanted to buy one of them. I randomly named the price, and he bought it. As it turned out later, he sold it at an auction for twice the price. He wanted to buy the rest for 5,000 each. For the world of contemporary art, it's not that much money. In the end, we sold them all. And then, Mom sent a few more of her works. I was going to tell my phenomenal success to my husband, but I didn't have the chance, Eleanor said. Six months ago, I found out that Julian was having an affair with a woman 15 years younger than him, with Alison York. I can't say I was upset, no. My immediate plan was to leave him and go to my daughter, but events began to unfold very swiftly and strangely. And here comes our dear Taylor. And did you tell Haley yet who I am to Ralph? Dr. Frey smiled. Oh, please don't tell me you're his son and Rory is his grandson, making him Grace's brother. Haley nervously chuckled. Taylor, my best student, one of those who gave meaning to my teaching activity at the university, Ralph said shortly. But let's give Eleanor the opportunity to continue. So many events happened in just a few months that they literally threw me off balance, Eleanor continued. Professional success, family breakdown, and finally, illness. Let's not specify the diagnosis. The story is quite unpleasant. I needed a small operation and subsequent bed rest. Dr. Frey, recommended by Ralph, did everything at the highest level, but I didn't recover from the surgery very well. I lay for a long time, hardly getting up. At that moment, Julian suggested hiring a companion for me to make things more cheerful. That's how Alison ended up in our house, about whom by then I knew practically everything. Fortunately, I had the resources to gather information. It was an unprecedented audacity, but I became curious about what would happen next, and then I started feeling worse and worse. Nausea, dizziness, tremors, mild hallucinations. I was constantly going to the hospital. Taylor was the one who supported me through all the nerves there. Yes, it was a tough nut to crack, confirmed Dr. Frey. It seemed like the patient was following all the recommendations. The tests were good, but her condition was deteriorating. We had to schedule additional tests because I suspected there might be some influence of an external medication. Yes, it didn't take long to guess, Eleanor added. Within a day, I noticed Alison slipping something into my tea. A little later, I overheard her conversation with Julian. He expressed concern about my health, and she said, Darling, sooner or later she won't be around anymore, it's inevitable, but I'll always be there for you. And he, the scoundrel, just smiled and kissed her. From that moment on, I decided to start a big game. You can't imagine the pleasure I felt, manipulating those who were sure they were manipulating me. I pretended to be insane, I pretended I couldn't walk, which gave me even greater freedom for maneuvers. You, Haley, happened to arrive at our house at the most vivid moment of this spectacle. Shortly after that, Taylor and I decided to introduce a new actor, Rory, into our splendid production who did an excellent job in the role of a nurse. At the same time, he installed several hidden cameras to gather dirt on both Alison and Julian. They thought I was confined to a wheelchair and fearlessly indulged in love affairs right in the living room when I was in my room. I still can't get over my outrage about this, exclaimed Haley. Well, this part of the story has become somewhat clearer to me, although not entirely. But as for Marta, I have nothing but questions. Oh yes, my dear and gentle Marta, Eleanor said softly. Her eyes filled with tears. We met her at the hospital, and I can confidently say that I have never encountered a more pure and noble person in my life. Fate was unfair to her. She didn't find her feminine happiness and didn't have children. She worked as a veterinarian all her life, constantly bringing home cats found on the street, sick and healthy ones, and a year ago she was diagnosed with cancer. At first she underwent treatment, but then it became clear that her days were numbered. I met with Marta every time I came to the hospital. One day I told her my story, and she was deeply moved by it. Marta herself wasn't afraid of death, but she was deeply concerned about her cats, who would surely perish once she was gone. Who needs such a fluffy army? Why did you decide to open a shelter for her pets? Haley asked. I got the impression that you're not particularly fond of cats. I can't stand them, to be honest, Eleanor grimaced. You notice that I brought a kitten from the hospital and immediately handed it over to Kristen's care. Mum, are you sure you want to continue? Grace suddenly asked Eleanor. 
I'll tell everything as I see fit, Eleanor mysteriously smiled. Haley is a smart woman. She'll understand everything. So I decided to open a shelter for Marta's cats, which made her very happy. You can't imagine how grateful she was. She cried tears of happiness for several days. It was during this time that she came up with this incredible plan, which at first seemed monstrous to me. Are you starting to figure it out, Haley? So Marta decided to end her life and set it up to make it look like it was you, Haley conjectured with horror. Oh no, I would never agree to such a thing. I may be eccentric, but there are limits to everything, Eleanor replied. Marta didn't have much time left. During her final weeks, she was barely holding on with the strongest painkillers, hardly getting up. And she passed away exactly on the day the Lord called her home, in her own bed. We hired a caregiver for her, who cared for Marta until her last breath. Eleanor covered her face with her hands. I'm sorry I don't understand anything, Haley murmured, looking around at everyone present. Basically, it was Marta's last will to play out such an incredible story. Eleanor was against it until I personally saw Julian handing Alison some powder, which she later used for her purpose, unexpectedly spoke Rory, who had been silent all this time. Nothing could be proven, but we understood that these two were in cahoots. Yes, and they used a substance that was quite difficult to detect in the blood. Part of it was eliminated from the body, exerting its harmful influence on all organs, Taylor added. You could say that Alison herself would hardly have gotten hold of such a thing, but Julian, with his connections, could. It's a good thing my beloved patient discovered all this in time and protected herself from poisoning. So you decided to make it so that your husband would be held accountable for the crime, but not entirely for the one he committed, Haley asked again. He wasn't at the forest cabin at the time of the fire, and how did Marta end up there, or supposedly Marta? We'll skip those details, Rory chuckled. You'll probably ask why Eleanor's ring ended up on her finger. That's how it goes. A person dies, and a few hours later, they're in another place, with someone else's ring on their finger. I consider it mysticism. There are no other options. Haley rubbed her temples with her fingertips. She wouldn't have even thought of such a twist, although her plots were sometimes more than convoluted. Well, nothing will happen to Julian. Ralph clapped his hands on his knees in frustration. Proving his involvement in Marta's death is impossible. The fact that he wanted to poison Eleanor, too. You didn't quite nail it, just a little. In the end, the scoundrel will walk out of jail, unlike his mistress. I agree with Dad, Grace supported him. I don't even want to think about what would have happened if they had succeeded. But that snake, Allison, I hope she gets what she deserves. I think this is a ready-made plot for your new novel, Haley. Taylor smiled and much more interesting than the story with the mystical paintings. Speaking of paintings, Eleanor exclaimed, if you'll allow me, my dear, Haley and I will go up to the studio together. I need to show her something. Haley followed the homeowner upstairs, still trying to make sense of the new information, realizing she hadn't learned everything. Haley, dear, I see you're shocked by everything you've heard, Eleanor said. Well, I won't hide it, Haley replied. To say I'm shocked is an understatement, but as for Julian, your husband was right. Nothing will happen to him. He didn't personally know Marta. He wasn't at the forest cabin at the time of the fire. More likely, the police will have a lot of questions about how she ended up there at all. And as I understand it, Rory is involved in this. We took care of that in advance so the police won't have as many questions as you think, Eleanor said mysteriously. The police already found Marta's phone, which contains her correspondence with my husband. But in his phone, these messages are deleted. But they can be restored, if desired. What? Haley couldn't believe her ears. Do I understand correctly that you somehow fabricated their correspondence? It was easier than you think, the artist shrugged. When my husband fell asleep, I sent a few messages from his phone to Marta. She replied, then I deleted everything. And what was in them? There weren't that many, Eleanor explained. But after reading even a few snippets of the correspondence, the reader would get the impression that they were having an affair, unrequited love. Julian literally drives Marta to the edge, and he invites her to the forest cabin. He invites her himself, yes. No one knows about this, not even Rory and Taylor. He wouldn't have supported such a spectacle, especially since he has nothing to do with it. Taylor only involved his son Rory in this game to keep control of the situation, 
and prevent me from being poisoned in the house. Haley looked at Eleanor with horror. Just recently, she idealized this woman, considering her a victim of monstrous circumstances. And while she listened to the part of the story where her husband's mistress tried to lure Eleanor's husband away, she mentally cursed Alison. But the episode with Marta completely blurred the line between good and evil. Yes, Julian committed a crime, becoming Alison's accomplice, or perhaps the initiator of gradually poisoning his wife. Why would he need a sick wife at his age when there was another younger and educated enough to impress business partners again? But Eleanor herself also committed a crime no matter how you look at it. And Rory was her accomplice. Haley had no doubt that he helped Eleanor. Eleanor seemed to read her thoughts. I guess I know what you're thinking right now, Haley. She interrupted Haley's thoughts. But why do you think I decided to tell you all this? Essentially, I confessed to a rather unpleasant act, didn't I? I suppose you knew I wouldn't believe the version you presented to everyone else, Haley guessed, and I certainly won't tell anyone anything. That's all true, of course, but those aren't the main reasons I entrusted you with this story because I've read several of your books, and I like them for one particular feature. You don't divide characters into good and bad. Your positive characters always have some flaws, and the criminal, on the contrary, is not devoid of good qualities, Haley. Yes, that's exactly how it happens in real life, Haley agreed. There's not just black and just white in the world. It's always a mixture of shades. Yes, exactly, Eleanor nodded. Most likely my husband will get away with it, even considering the facts I told you about. Or maybe he won't. But what do you think? Do I feel even the slightest pang of conscience about setting up Julian like that, huh? No, I don't. I Eleanor had just uncovered what Haley regarded with some trepidation, her lack of personal writerly courage. Yes, her book characters were truly alive, genuine. That's why readers loved her novels. There were no plastic heroes in them, capable of acting only on one bright or dark side. But it was all somewhat superficial, neat. However, she envied a bit those authors who managed to make the audience fall in love with negative characters. They become some of the most famous characters in world literature, because readers see in them their hidden and quite tangible facets of personality. At the moment, Haley was contemplating as a writer, but the deeper she delved into her thoughts, the more she came to the conclusion that, in Eleanor's place, she would have acted exactly the same. Revenge is not always a dish best served cold. Served hot, it produces a much more stunning effect. After a few weeks, it became known that Julian had actually managed to avoid criminal charges. His lawyers were able to prove that he had nothing to do with Marta's death. Moreover, he distanced himself from Alison as much as he could, instantly forgetting about his unearthly love for this woman. As a result, Alison had to take all the blame and confess to what she had done. However, Julian's reputation was completely destroyed, and his political career was effectively over. Eleanor filed for divorce, and he was very worried that she would now start dividing their home. The man was surprised when he found out that she was leaving the country with their daughter and Ralph, with whom Eleanor had unexpectedly reconciled. But even that wasn't so upsetting. Information about the value of Eleanor's paintings literally knocked Julian out of his usual rhythm of life. After all, he should have taken a better interest in art and properly appreciated his wife's creativity. When there were only a few days left before Eleanor and Grace's departure, Haley came to their house to say goodbye. Julian has been overwhelmed by all these divorce proceedings. He's been in the hospital for a week now, Eleanor explained from the doorway, and Ralph and Grace went to buy souvenirs for their friends. So it's just you and me, Haley. I'll miss you so much, Haley said sadly, entering the house, which already seemed empty and unfamiliar. The artist's paintings were taken down from the walls, making the room seem impersonal and lifeless. I suggest you come visit us, Eleanor took Haley's hand. I admit, you're the most precious person I'm leaving behind. I'll miss Rory and Taylor, of course, but my friends just sent a message to say goodbye, that's all. At least they shed a tear at my funeral. I really hope we'll see each other again, no matter where, Haley replied with a smile. And I'll be closely following your creative successes, Eleanor, but maybe you'll at least reveal the secret now. How did you manage to depict plots that happened later? Oh, Haley, I'm afraid to disappoint you, but 
It's just another fiction, Eleanor shrugged. I didn't predict anything, my dear. How is that possible? Haley exclaimed. What about the story with the girl who jumped off the cliff? And well, okay, I'll tell you, it's really hard to guess, she squinted. I once painted that very landscape, the cliff and the sea. When I found out from the news about the tragedy with the high school girl happening there, I simply added the girl I saw in the photo wearing a veil. But Alison saw my painting first, and only by evening heard the story. She probably just correlated these two facts and immediately started talking about mysticism, about the prediction effect. There was no prediction there. In the original version of the painting, the girl simply wasn't there. But why would I disappoint her, Haley? The game was in full swing, and it gave me another reason to tease her, that's all. Did you create other plots in the same way? Haley clarified. It depends. That series of paintings you saw wasn't tied to external events at all. I transferred onto the canvas only what was inside me, and everyone saw something different. For example, Alison, the criminal, got scared. You started deciphering the symbolism, while Julian just didn't get anything. Well, you know, sometimes I depict events that haven't happened yet but will definitely happen, Eleanor suddenly replied. For instance, over these days I painted a couple of new works, the sky, sunset, and the wing of an airplane, as if I see it all from the plane window. Well, there's certainly no mystique in that. It will happen to you very soon, Haley smiled. Can I take a look? Oh, I think I already packed them, Eleanor waved her hand. Let's have tea for the last time, Haley. I'll brew it myself now. Kristin has finally started working as an administrator at our cat shelter. It feels like she's in the right place now. She even reminds me of Marta in some ways. So kind-hearted. Haley understood. Eleanor was genuine right now, just like this. Even in the wheelchair, she managed to remain in motion. But still, her posture, gait, and natural grace added completeness to her image. Age seemed not to touch this woman, as there was more energy and life in her than in many of Haley's peers, although Haley was younger. Parting with Eleanor was actually hard, although this amazing woman had already played her role in Haley's life. After shedding a few tears, they agreed to see each other again. In the evening, Haley met Taylor. It was raining outside, so he picked her up in his car. So where would you like to go today? The doctor asked, kissing Haley on the cheek. The rain will continue for a while. You know what? Let's just park the car and take a walk down the street, Haley suddenly suggested, realizing that a lot would depend on the man's answer. Walk in the rain? Taylor smiled. Sure. Haley threw herself around his neck and hugged him tightly. Just wait a minute, I'll show you something first. Taylor whispered, gently pulling away. He took out a painting wrapped in paper from the back seat, in a thin wooden frame. So I dropped by yesterday to say goodbye to my favorite patient, Eleanor, and she gave me this. He grinned cheerfully. Take a look. Can you recognize anyone here, huh? Haley looked at the painting and felt her heart pounding madly in her chest. This time, there was no hidden symbolism or blurred faces in Eleanor's work. It depicted a spacious white hall for celebrations, with large windows and columns. Dressed up people in the background, and in the middle of the hall stood a smiling tailor, holding the hand of a happy Haley in a snowy white dress.